Good morning. morning. Please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship that's printed in the bulletin. Before and after, first and last, the steadfast love of God endures forever. Let us pray. O God, who opens our prison doors and releases us from our faults, keep us near to you in the hours each day that by the power of the prayer Jesus prays for us and the light of your word, we might drink of your living water, know true joy, 
and serve you to the end of time. Amen. Please be seated. Trusting in the promise of grace, let us tell the whole truth about ourselves and beg God's mercy for the renewal and amendment of our lives. Holy God, you have shown your... Doubt, nor death, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Holy God, whose voice is heard in the thunder and in the silence, speak to us now by the power of your Spirit that we may hear your word for us today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our first reading today on this last Sunday of the Easter season comes from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 16, 
and tells about one of the times of, in Paul's ministry when, of course, as usual, he got into trouble. So let us listen to what God is saying to us today. One day as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw their hope for making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. And then turning to the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter is really one long prayer that Jesus prayed the night that he was betrayed. Sometimes this is referred to as the real Lord's Prayer. But in the section we will be looking at today, hearing today, he is praying for not only his disciples, but for all who will come after them. So let us continue to listen to what God is saying directly to us today. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that 
those also whom you have given me will be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is important to note that in Jesus' longest and most fervent prayer, He is praying for the unity of the church, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Unity in Christ. That's what I would like us to think about in the sermon this morning. What is the secret of Christian unity? What causes churches to become divided? For members to get at odds with each other? And what effect does the unity of the church, or the lack thereof, have on its witness and its ability to make disciples and to grow? Now relax now. I am not here to step on any toes. I don't have a hidden hidden agenda. I do not see you as a conflicted congregation. Now, I'm sure that you've had your ups and downs, and I'm guessing that you have had your share of disagreements over the years, but that's natural. All churches do. And so you know, uh, Lawrence and I have had a great time uh, getting to know you over the past month and a half. You've allowed us to come into your hearts. You've been open and honest. Uh, You've received us warmly and treated us kindly. Um, We could not be more impressed and grateful. So listen to the sermon as objectively as you can and consider how it applies to you. What I want to explore is what Scripture teaches us about the dynamics of a healthy family. Because, after all, that's what the church of Jesus Christ is, or ought to be. A family of faith, siblings in Christ, working together for the common good. The first passage I want to lift up is from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians where he says, I don't cease to give thanks for you and I pray that the Father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places. He put all things in sub." under his feet and gave him to be head over all the things for the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all when it comes to unity in Christ this is rule number one Jesus is the head of the body not you not me not anyone else He alone is head of the household. When a pastor or an individual member of the church violate this rule, you can be sure that conflict is on its way. Now, truth to tell, most conflict in the church has to do with power struggles. And the basic question of Who is going to call the shots? I heard about a certain church that wanted to celebrate its 40th 
birthday with a big homecoming celebration. <laughs> Forty, they have nothing on us. Uh, anyway, they invited all the former members who had moved away to come back for the festivities. They asked for all former ministers to take part in the service. When you've only been in existence for 40 years, you can do that because they're still alive. Uh, it was a big deal for everyone. And on the day of the homecoming, the place was packed. Afterwards, there was dinner on the grounds where old friends ate and swap stories from the past. Now, not all were happy memories. The church has seen a lot of conflict over the years. And to be honest, some of the former members who came for the homecoming just came from across town. Well, it just so happened that one of the former ministers and one of the lay leaders during his tenure met face to face in the middle of the sanctuary after the service. Two big guys. Up to this point, they had made a wide circle around each other. But now it was a moment of reckoning. Members watched try not to appear to be watching as that these two men renewed old acquaintances. At first, they shook hands awkwardly and spoke formally. Then one of them blurted out, I should have apologized to you years ago. To which the other replied, Oh no, I was the one who was out of line. Before long, these two old geezers were hugging each other and crying tears that they had held back for years. When they went home that afternoon, their old wounds were healed. They were reconciled at last. Jesus Christ is head of the church. Never forget that. When it comes to maintaining unity in the body of Christ, it's rule number one. Now, rule number two is this. Every member of the body of Christ is important to the well-being of the whole. Each one of us has a vital role to play. In a healthy church, there are no peons and there are no VIPs. This is how Paul described it. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, where the Jews are Greek, where the bond are free, and were all given to drink into one spirit. And he goes on to say, If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body. It is not, therefore, not part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? The eye cannot tell the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those Members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those parts of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow more abundant honor. So in a healthy church, every member counts. Every member is valued and loved and treated with respect and given a job to do within the range of his or her abilities. No one is overlooked or taken for granted. An economics professor greeted his new crop of MBA hopefuls with an announcement. This is for first class, mind you. He said, we shall begin with a short examination. 
with that, he wrote one question on the board. What is the cleaning lady's name? Well, the students snickered. You've got to be kidding. Then he said, if you hope to manage a large corporation one day, first gain the respect of the people who make it successful. Your success will depend on them more than you will ever know. Well, it was a lesson they never forgot. In the Church of Jesus Christ, every member is essential to the well-being of the whole. All right, we come now to rule number three. Conflict is inevitable. It's a natural result when two or more healthy egos are working together. You see it one way, I see it another. Unless we have a church full of doormats, you can expect to have a certain amount of conflict. We will not all agree on all things. I mean, that's just the way it is. The good news is conflict is not the root of division. Division occurs when the conflict goes unresolved or when it's resolved in a way that is hurtful. Jesus said, uh, If therefore you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has anything against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Did you notice who is supposed to make the first move? Listen again. If your brother has something against you, you take the initiative. Don't wait for him to come to you. And also take note of this. As far as Jesus is concerned, reconciliation trumps worship. Leave your gift and go find your brother. Talk it over. Find a way to resolve your differences. Then go back and make your offering. There's also the Matthew 18 approach which is one that we find in the Book of Order of the Presbyterian Church USA. This is how uh, we are reminded to resolve differences. If your brother sins against you, go. Show him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained back your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two more with you that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to hear the church also, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. You know, so often when there is a conflict in the church, the one who is upset tells everyone except the one with whom he or she is upset. As Dr. Phil might say, and how is that working for you? When you've hurt someone's feelings or when someone hurts your feelings, the hardest thing in the world to do is to face them one on one. You really want to avoid them like the plague. And make no mistake about it, they want to avoid you too, as if the less said, the better. But it doesn't work that way. Unresolved conflict never goes away. It just sinks to a deeper level. And if you don't do something about it, It'll fester and grow and lead to even worse conflicts in the future. Conflict is inevitable. What's important is how you resolve it. Ironically, 
conflict can bring you closer to the other person when you go about resolving it the right way. It can actually help you get to know each other more intimately and to take each other more seriously. And if a conflict is inevitable, then so is anger. This leads to rule number four. It comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians again where he says, Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Anger is an emotion, nothing more, nothing less. It can be an intense and powerful emotion, even overwhelming at times. But it is still, as I used to tell my third graders, it is still only an emotion. Like conflict, it's not anger that's the problem. It's what you do with it. To hurt someone intentionally because you're angry is a sin. To channel your anger in a positive and constructive way is a virtue. I'm probably telling you a story that you've heard before, but Candy Leitner's daughter, Carrie, was killed by a drunk driver in 1980. She was 13 years old. Candy's anger, as we can imagine, was off the charts. She was livid beyond words. But instead of attacking the driver who killed her daughter, she attacked the problem of drunk driving. Well, you know the story. She founded the organization MADD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. She didn't stop drunk driving but she made a dent in the problem. And because of her efforts, Carrie did not die in vain. Her death served as a catalyst for change. So be angry, but do not sin. That's the first part of the rule. And the second part is just as important. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Now we're all guilty of nursing wounds, and holding on to grudges as if we think that's a way of punishing those who hurt us. But it's counterproductive. When you hold on to your hurt and your anger, you only punish yourself. The best thing you can do is get it out of your system. Go to the gym and work out. Hit a bag of balls at the driving range. Chop firewood, clean the house, come clean my house, weed the flower beds, give the dog a bath, you know, whatever works for you. Get it out of your system and let it go. Unresolved anger is a poison that kills everything in its path. Okay, let's wrap it up here. Before Leaving the earth, Jesus prayed for the unity of the church that would bear his name, and for good reason. When we live and work together in the name of Jesus Christ, we present a clear witness of faith to the world around us. Others can catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God by the way we love and respect each other, and by how, by how we are able to confront and forgive each other, speaking the truth in love. As a result, they are drawn closer to the throne of God's grace, and the church prospers and grows. But just be aware, the opposite is also true. When we're divided and at odds with each other, our witness is lost, and the world fails to take our message seriously. Christian unity is as important as what we profess to believe. The programs that we offer, the good deeds we do for others. And what is the key? Four basic rules. 
Rule number one, Jesus Christ is head of the church. Rule number two, each member is essential to the well-being of the whole. Rule number three, conflict is inevitable. What's important is how you resolve it. And rule number four, be angry, but don't take your anger, anger out on others and don't hold on to it overnight. Oh, and I almost forgot. Rule number five, when in doubt, refer to rule number one. Jesus Christ is head of the church. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now, having heard the word of God read and proclaimed, let us rise in body or in spirit as we are able and proclaim what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Now, before I begin the prayer of the people, uh, are there any that we need to lift up uh, today? then let us go to God in prayer. Our God, the heavens declare your glory and the firmament shows the work of your hands. One day tells its tale to another and each night imparts wisdom to the next. The sun, the moon, the seas, the dry lands, the plants that enrich the earth, the creatures that swim and fly and run, all these gifts of your creation, although they have no words or language, their sound goes out to all the lands and their messages to the ends of the earth. We offer our prayers for the earth and recommit ourselves to honor and protect it. May we hear the cries of creation and see in its power and beauty your own image and your deep love for what you have made. May we love all of your creation, every grain of sand, every leaf, every ray of light, ancient trees, pollinating bees, and all animals. May we not trouble the earth's life or waste its resources or abuse its beauty. May we look on the natural world with reverence and acknowledge that we are small in the vastness of the universe. We know that for you, O oh God, all life is like an ocean. All is flowing and blending, and that when we withhold any measure of love from anything in your universe, we withhold the same measure of love from you. Lord God, as we pray, we bring our sisters and brothers, strangers and neighbors into your presence. We rejoice with those who rejoice today, those who have found love, those who have been healed of disease, those who look forward to marriage or the birth of children, those who have meaningful work and happy families, those who have safe and happy homes, those who worship you in freedom and the beauty of holiness. And we weep with those who weep today, those who are sick in their bodies, their minds, their spirits, those who have lost beloved sons and daughters and fathers and mothers to gun violence, 
Those who have lost jobs are those who cannot find meaningful work and struggle for ways to use their gifts. Those who flee their own lands and homes seeking refuge and the strength and grace of a new community. We weep today for and with the people of Ukraine who face unimaginable loss and suffering as their cities and homes and families and lives are destroyed by brutal violence. We weep also for the families in Texas who are burying their children. We are heartbroken over the loss of more lives, children dying before they have a chance to live, hopes and dreams cut off and smashed to pieces by gunfire and bullets. When Jesus said to let the little children come to him, this is not what he meant. Bring them peace. Be close to all who suffer this day, O God. And even in the midst of suffering, we offer the gratitude that is in our hearts, gratitude for our lives, for our church community, for the freedom to worship, for the food and shelter and friendship that sustain us each day. By your Holy Spirit, Hold the church in unity and keep it faithful to your word so that breaking bread together, we may be one with Christ in faith and love and service now and forever. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are called to give with generous hearts that all people may hear God's words and be helped by the work of this church. The offering plates are near the back door. Uh, feel free to drop your tithes and offerings in there.
Let us pray. Eternal God, who brings joy out of sorrow, plenty out of want, life out of death, we thank you for the treasures of the earth, your creation filled with your blessing. For it was in company with these earthly things that your Son came to dwell, showing us the enormity of your love. Because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we too are brought to new life, called to pray and work for the renewal of others. Take these offerings for the sake of the one without whom our poverty would be extreme, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we go forth from this place, let us remember that wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ who dwells within you has something he wants to do through you. And God has given you the Holy Spirit to guide you, equip you, and sustain you along the way. Believe it and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the peace and fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.